Okay, the big moment's finally here. Uh, it is noon by our clock, so we're going to get started with the main event, uh, Childhood Obesity Research Demonstration, or CORD project, implementing strategies across the community to help families with childhood obesity. My name is Brooks Ballard, and I'm with the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living here at the University of Texas School of Public Health, and we are very excited to host today's webinar. I'd like to cover a little bit of housekeeping before we kick things off. First of all, I'll answer the single most popular question we get for all of our webinars, and that's yes, we are recording this webinar, and we will make an archive and a PDF of the presentation slides available on the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living website, msdcenter.org, later this week. Uh, we do want to hear other questions from you, though, today, and you can type those in using the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel. You're encouraged to type in your questions at any time, but to keep us on schedule, we'll hold off on answering the questions until the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Deanna Helscher, who will then introduce our other guests. Dr. Helscher is the director of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living and the John P. McGovern Professor in Health Promotion at the University of Texas School of Public Health, Austin Regional Campus. Her research interests in, are in the design, implementation, and evaluation of programs, policies, and measurement tools related to child nutrition and physical activity, and she's been recognized by state, national, and international organizations for her expertise in child nutrition and physical activity research. She's currently working on projects to document the dissemination of the CATCH, or Coordinated Approach to Child Health program, across Texas, evaluate the effects of nutrition and physical activity policies on child health, and to elucidate the interactions between genetic factors and dietary behaviors. She's also the principal investigator for the Texas CORD project. Dr. Helscher is the former president of the International Society for Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity, and she served on the Institute of Medicine Committee on Evaluating Obesity Prevention Efforts, a plan for measuring progress. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Helscher to introduce our other excellent guests. Dr. Helscher. Thank you, Brooks. I am happy to introduce uh, two of my colleagues and co-presenters today. Uh, the first is Captain Heidi Blank, who is CDC's Chief of the Obesity Prevention and Control Branch in the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity. Dr. Blank has more than 15 years of CDC experience as a United States Public Health Service Officer and has authored over 90 epidemiologic papers and reports in the area of nutrition, physical activity, obesity, and environmental exposures. Dr. Blank is an active member of the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research, or NCOR. She is the creator and senior advisor to the agency's Nutrition and Obesity Policy Research and Evaluation Network, or NOPRIN, and the Childhood Obesity Research Demonstration, or CORD product, uh, project. Uh, welcome, Dr. Blank. Dr. Guadalupe Ayala is the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Health and Human Services at San Diego State University and co-director of the Institute for Behavioral and Community Health, a nonprofit research institute whose mission is to better understand Latino health disparities and ways to ameliorate them. Dr. Ayala is principal investigator of several studies that examine a range of factors related to the health and well-being of families and communities. These include studies aimed at improving access to and consumption of healthy foods, by working with small food stores and restaurants, promoting physical activity through community health worker support, and preventing and controlling obesity, diabetes, and asthma through multi-sector, multi-level changes. Her research has resulted in over 130 publications. Welcome, Dr. Ayala. And and so I'd like to turn the mic over to Captain Blank, who will begin with the introduction to the CORD project. Thank you, Brooks and Deanna. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very honored to represent the CDC CORD team today to tell you a little more about the Childhood Obesity Research Demonstration, or the CORD project. First, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our hardworking CDC team, including Drs. Brooke Belay. Lieutenant Commander Jen Foltz, Carrie Doima, and Captain Nancy Williams. Next slide. 
So childhood obesity, as many of us know, has been um, an important epidemic and public health concern for the United States. Over one in six U.S. youth have obesity, and we know that disparities exist within the numbers that we see. Despite this epidemic, we have few published studies from multiple setting interventions that have shown improved behaviors and reduced obesity or BMI among children. Therefore, there was a need to look at models that look at primary prevention across the settings where children 2 to 12 spend their time, as well as supporting those children who already have obesity, what we'd call weight management for support for children screened and those in need of family-based treatment. In 2009, the CORD project was authorized through the CHIP, or the Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act. <clears throat> Appropriations in the amount of $25 million came through the Affordable Care Act in 2010. Through a competitive FOA project, CDC awarded cooperative agreements to four awardees, and in the future discussions, we'll be hearing from those. The core population of interest was children 2 to 12 years of age who were either CHIP or CHIP eligible. These children are of lower socioeconomic status, have higher rates of obesity, and often have disparate access to care and health outcomes. CORD was intended to determine whether an integrated primary care and public health approach could help prevent and control obesity in children. As part of the FOA, we worked with grantees to look at a portfolio of evidence-based interventions. So unlike a um, multi-site intervention that may use a one template approach, we really worked with the communities to adapt evidence-based interventions to their context. Next slide. This is a visual diagram showing our model of CORD. On our left side, as we look at inputs, we think about the multiple settings where children and families spend their time. This includes the healthcare system, early care and education or child care, school settings, community venues, including park and recreation, restaurant and retail, the home environment, as well as a key uh, bridge here for us, the community health worker. These fit into our model to think about not just policy system and environmental change or the outer aspects of the social ecological model, but also thinking about the whole individual, thinking about how to create social support, education, knowledge, and skills. Therefore, because this is a research project, we hope not to only benefit the children and families in the research communities, but also to create best practices and recommendations for the future for sharing a community context and lessons learned. Next slide. Today we're going to hear from the work of the three demonstration sites and the evaluation center. This is a four-year funded cooperative agreement from the CDC, and you can see that funding has gone from September 2011 and will fun uh, finish this September 2015. The grantees are supported by a CDC team of multiple disciplines, and more of this can be read in the Williams et al. article in the Childhood Obesity Supplement. This team approach has helped with both the scientific and grants management aspects, uh, and it was part of a, a large undertaking, which was the facilitation of common measures across the three sites. In addition to the Williams et al. paper, the Fultz et al. paper in the supplement describes the strengths and challenges of the evaluation design, as well as coming up with common measures as we work with communities to adapt science-based interventions to their local context. Next slide. Each of the sites will tell you a little bit more about the communities, but in general, the demonstra demonstration sites included urban and rural communities, a high percentage of low-income residents and families, high childhood obesity rates, ethnically diverse populations, and in all cases, state and local health department linkages. Next slide. Each of the sites worked across multiple settings to deliver effective evidence-based interventions, as well as reaching parents and other uh, decision makers. This slide just shows an example of the healthcare setting, as we can see different interventions that were chosen, and these will be uh, discussed or you can read more about them in the supplement. But for example, aspects of healthcare could include motivational interviewing, use of information systems or electronic medical records, trainings of health care providers, as well as improved coordinated care. And for children who are already uh, struggling with overweight or obesity, referral to family or child nutrition and physical activity intervention programs, or what we might call pediatric weight management support. 
In addition to those delivery systems, we also worked on policy system and environment changes, for example, in the clinic, using things such as healthy bending. Next slide. Although there are many outcomes that we'll talk about, those that were very specific to child health included weight-related changes, behavioral changes, as those you can see here, such as increases in fruits and vegetables, water, decreases in things like sugar-sweetened beverages. We also measure the amount of physical activity, screen time, and then sleep duration and quality, as well as quality of life. Next slide. So um, we're very excited to share with you the baseline supplement from the Childhood Obesity Journal. And in this journal, uh, we want to make sure folks are aware of the, of the many um, baselines assessments and model evaluations for CORD. Next slide. Thank you. All right, now we'll hand it over to Dr. Ayala. Uh, good morning. I am Guadalupe Suchi Ayala, and I'll provide an overview of the California CORD study, followed by an overview of the Massachusetts CORD study. Uh, first, on behalf of the California CORD um, and my two principal investigators, Ms. Leticia Ibarra from Clinicas de Salud del Pueblo and Dr. Amy Bingley Vallarta from the Imperial County Health Department, thank you for joining us today. California, California CORD, or more commonly referred to as Our Choice, Nuestra Opción, is a partnership between three agencies, San Diego State University, Clinicas de Salud del Pueblo, which is a federally qualified health center, and the Imperial County Public Health Department. Our Choice is being implemented in Imperial County, California, as you can see there on the map. It is located on the U.S.-Mexico border and is considered a rural community. Given its proximity to the border, the population is predominantly Latino or specifically Mexican origin and is generally characterized as underserved and hard to reach. Our commitment to working collaboratively with our partners as reflected in the members of the research team and the advisory committee organizations compelled us to try and address the problem of childhood obesity in Imperial County. State estimates suggest that Imperial County has one of the highest rates of childhood obesity uh, in the state and maybe even in the country. Next slide. The study designed for our choice is a two by two factorial. So consistent with the FOA, we were interested in testing whether the combination of a healthcare intervention plus a public health intervention was more effective at reducing excess weight gain among children two to 12 over a 12 month period compared to a healthcare intervention only, a public health intervention only, or a no treatment control condition. Um, although our main outcomes are powered for 12 months, data are also being collected at 18 months to determine whether any changes we observed at 12 months are sustained. And we're also collecting data on the children's parents to see if they experience concurrent changes in weight and health behaviors. Next slide. The healthcare intervention is based on the obesity care model as depicted in this slide and involve policy changes in the manner in which children are diagnosed and treated for overweight and obesity, as well as practice changes, such as changes to the electronic health records to alert providers when a child has a BMI that is in the at-risk range. Self-management support is provided in the form of evidence-based family wellness program and physical activity workshops that are delivered by Clinicas Employed Community Health Workers. Next slide. The public health intervention involved, is involving working with early care and education centers, schools, community recreation organizations, and restaurants to create an environment that supports a healthy lifestyle for all children. Our four primary strategies for changes at the organizational level included promoting policy, system, and environmental changes. Um, these occur through capacity building, <clears throat> for example, to promote physical activity by training um, early care and education providers and school teachers to use SPARC to implement active play and to encourage scheduling of uh, physical education. Physical environmental changes were made to promote water consumption and system changes were created in several restaurants to make healthy child menu options the easy option. Across all sectors, a communication campaign promoted the four key behaviors as mentioned earlier by Dr. Blanc. 
Next slide. As part of this effort, Dr. Emmeline Trang of the University of California, Los Angeles, received additional funding from the John Hopkins Global Center on Childhood Obesity to expand our evaluation efforts to really look at implementation effectiveness. Time limits prohibit me from going into details about this, but you can find a lot in her paper in the supplement. But briefly, the model is testing the extent to which the intervention was delivered with fidelity and is using a mixed method as approach. For me as an interventionist who has worked in various settings to attempt to create sustainable changes, this model will really help us to examine the moderating role of organizational and community features that influence implementation effectiveness and ultimately our primary outcome of childhood obesity. Next slide. Although our interventions are reaching everyone who is touched by them, we have recruited a cohort of 1,186 children and their parents to participate in an evaluation cohort, and we are tracking their behaviors over the 18-month period I mentioned. As you can see from this slide, not surprising, most of the parents are the mothers of the children, and most of the families are of Mexican origin. Consistent with the FOA requirements, we are reaching a low-income population as reflected in the SNAP benefits received. Next slide. The sample of children in our evaluation cohort reflect what we know about the health behaviors and health status of children in this community. Rates of overweight and obesity are over 50% for boys and girls. And as you can see from the behavioral data on the right hand side, 20% of the children, uh, this is based on parent report, 20% of the children uh, did not eat any fruit the previous day, uh, close to a third did not eat any, any vegetables, and almost half consumed some form of sugary beverage the day before. And recall that these are kids between 2 and 11 years old. It is clear from these statistics there is room for improvement in these outcomes, and we are hopeful that this intervention has some impact on both the health behaviors and health status of these children and families. Next slide. Great. I will now present on behalf of the Mass, uh, Mass in Motion Kids Project, MA Cord, led by Dr. Thomas Mann from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and researchers from Harvard University, uh, including but not limited to Dr. Kirsten Davison, Dr. Ellie Taveras, and Dr. Steve Gordmacher. Next slide. The Massachusetts Cord Project, or more commonly referred to as Mass in Motion Kids, is a partnership between the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, the Mass General Hospital for Children, the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, the National Institute for Children's Health Quality, among the partner organizations. Mass in Motion's Kids is occurring in two communities as depicted on this um, slide, Fitchburg and New Bedford. And as you can see, the um, rates of children living in poverty are quite high. Next slide. The Mass in Motion Kids framework, uh, consistent with the overall CORD project, is a multi-level, multi-sector, whole community intervention. It draws from uh, evidence from the Institute of Medicine, as well as models such as the Obesity Chronic Care Model and the Energy Gap Model. The communities were selected in part because they have higher rates of low-income residents and substantially higher rates of childhood obesity. The aims of Mass in Motion Kids is to examine the extent to which this comprehensive systematic intervention reduces childhood obesity among underserved children 2 to 12 years old. Next slide. Here are some characteristics of the communities themselves, and you can see in Dr. Tavares' article additional information. I would mainly like to point out that the, the diversity of the two communities, as you can see here, uh, almost 50% of the uh, children in Fitchburg are Hispanic and uh, close to a third in New Bedford. Next slide. The Mass in Motion Kids intervention involved working with federally qualified health centers, WIC, early care and education centers, schools and after school programs, and the community through the efforts of a community coalition. Intervention strategies involved um, supporting 
uh, individual and family changes as well as system and policy changes. Additional details about the approaches that they are taking can be found in Dr. Tavares's article. Next slide. The Mass and Motion Kids Intervention um, developed some really nice materials. You can see an example of it here. They really had uh, families and kids focus on some of the five, for them, the five key behaviors, which was decreasing sugary beverages, decreasing screen time, increasing physical activity, replacing unhealthy foods with fruits and vegetables, and increasing sleep. I think that was really a, a nice feature in all of our interventions is a concurrent focus on sleep. Next slide. Additional details about the logic model that guided their uh, efforts can be found in Dr. Davison's article. But essentially, the uh, logic model depicts how they're using existing resources in the community, both at the community level as well as the agency level, to um, create some outputs or intervention programs in these various settings, and then how they're evaluating it using a mixed methods approach. Next slide. As you can see from these data, 42% uh, of the children were overweight or obese at baseline, and this is based on data that were collected in the schools, fourth, uh, first, fourth, and seventh grades. Next slide. Uh, what is interesting to all of us is seeing the similar, although in some cases higher rates of not consuming vegetables and fruits the previous day and a significant percentage of children consuming some form of sugar beverage the previous day. These data are based on self-reported data from fourth and seventh grade students that were surveyed at baseline in these schools. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Ayala. Uh, this is Deanna Helsher, and I will now talk about the Texas CORD site and then end up with a overview of the evaluation site at the University of Houston. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge my study team investigators and partners. I am a principal investigator along with Nancy Butte at the Children's Nutrition Research Center at Baylor College of Medicine. We have a variety of investigators and a multidisciplinary team that include our Department of State Health Services as well as the Healthy Weight Partnership, uh, the MEN program, the School of Public Health at CUNY, um, Seton Healthcare Center, and Duke University at Singapore. We also have a list of community partners that include both Houston and Austin independent school districts, the YMCA of Houston and Austin, and Head Starts in both Houston and Austin. The aims of our study are threefold and include first the evaluation of a two-year primary prevention obesity program in catchment areas in Austin and Houston. Secondly, we will implement and evaluate the efficacy of a systems level approach in a 12-month family-based secondary prevention program. And finally, we are seeking to quantify the cost effectiveness of the 12-month secondary prevention program. In all of these aims, our focus is on low-income and diverse Medicaid-eligible populations, as in the other CORD sites. Also, we stratify our interventions according to age grouping and developmental level. So we have a 2- to 5-year-old group, a 6- to 8-year-old group, and a 9- to 12-year-old group. Thus, we have intervention and control conditions in two cities, both Houston and Austin. Our, this is a schematic of our study design. A more complete and detailed version of the study design can be found in our article in uh, Childhood Obesity. But our study includes two yet levels of obesity prevention. So primary prevention, which I'll focus on here, uh, uses a framework that includes the obesity chronic care model, the social ecological model, and social cognitive theory. So primary prevent prevention focuses on efforts that target the health of the entire community. These healthy eating and active living messages focus on the cord, the cord uh, behavioral 
the core key behaviors that are shown to be evidence-based for obesity prevention and encourage healthy behaviors. We accomplished this by implementing multi-level programs for different components. The Coordinated Approach to Child Health or CATCH School-Based Obesity Prevention Program for elementary schools, the CATCH Early Childhood for Early Care and Education or Child Care Centers. We use the electronic health record, obesity screening, and the next steps brief counseling for primary health care clinics. And then we use community programs such as our Your Health Matters Growing Healthy Active Communities, which is a training to promote systems and environmental changes in the community. Children who are identified as having overweight or obesity at the healthcare clinic are screened and referred to our secondary prevention program. This diagram outlines our secondary prevention program. If you look at the top third, that diagram shows our focus on families with children who have overweight obesity within the primary prevention areas. This is conducted through a randomized clinical trial design. Once the physician identifies the child and family, a brief counseling session is held, and then the family is referred to be allocated to either our usual care and self-paced next steps program or the Texas CORD secondary prevention. In the comparison group, the families receive the uh, booklet, which is self-paced, along with follow-ups by physicians. Although in the Texas CORD secondary prevention intervention, the behavioral messages are the same, but this part of the intervention is structured to be more intensive, both in time and involvement. In the intervention, the families are linked with community health workers who facilitate their engagement in the program and implement specific program components. The preschool age children, the two to five year olds, participate in the MEND program for preschoolers, which is one 90 minute meeting per week for 10 weeks. This is then followed by a nine month post program, which includes one meeting per month with parents and children and text messages. These post program sessions include reinforcement of MEND messages, role model stories from the Being Well book, Activities for the children, including MEND World, are physical activities adapted from our CATCH program, and cooking classes. For the elementary school age kids from 6 to 8 and 9 to 12, the MEND CATCH program includes two meetings per week for two hours, with a transition then to the same nine-month post-program. The elementary school children are also uh, transition to YMCA sports teams. The MEND program is conducted at the YMCA's, so it's a natural fit for them to go into the YMCA sports programs where they participate in team sports such as basketball or swimming or exercise sessions. In this part of the intervention, we have a sample size of 576 with 288 in the intervention and 288 um, focused on for the comparison. The timeline for Texas CORD takes place over two years. With primary prevention, the intervention spans two years in the community components with cross-sectional measurements in spring 2012, which is baseline for us. Uh, 2013 is an interim measure and then 2014 is a follow-up measure. The intervention began in fall of 2012 after baseline measurements and then continues throughout two years. The secondary prevention program lasts a year and the intervention includes one-year cohorts beginning in October 2012 with a new cohort starting every three to five months. Measurements for each cohort are longitudinal and occur at baseline three months and 12 months. Our first paper in the supplement describes how we determined our study areas, our catchment areas in both Austin and Houston. We wanted to be sure that both sites for intervention and comparison were comparable. 
if you look at these, the comparison section for Austin is on the bottom and the intervention section is on the top. And in Houston, it's reversed. So the intervention section catchment area is on the bottom and the comparison's on the top. To determine the study sites or catchment area, we use GIS to determine census tracts with the appropriate populations. So to do that, we developed an index composed of five census parameters, which included percent African American, percent Hispanic Latino population, the percent of adults greater than 25 years old with less than 12 years of education, the percent of families with children under 18 years of age at 185% of the poverty level, and the percent of houses worth 100,000 or less. What we did was we then divided each of these parameters into quintiles and assigned a value of one low to five high. This, these all five parameters were summed to determine a composite index score, which ranged from five to 25 with higher scores indicating more diversity and less income. We then grouped the census tracts in contiguous areas, focusing around our clinics, schools, and uh, child care centers. Then to evaluate how well this method worked, we looked at school level uh, catchment area data in both catchment areas and compared them by intervention control and by Austin Houston. When we looked at them by intervention and control differences, we found a few demographic differences, but no differences in terms of food outlets or physical activity assets. However, when we looked at them by community, Austin versus Houston, we found more demographic differences. In general, Austin was still low on income, but had higher education and higher income compared to Houston and there were differences in the food environment. Uh, there were more food outlets, specifically grocery stores and smaller stores in Houston. Thus, this method validated our decision to look at intervention catchment areas in both cities rather than stratifying using communities. This diagram here just shows how the quintiles played out in the uh, census tracts. So where it's darker, shows the higher level of diversity and um, more low income. Finally, these are the data from our primary prevention baseline parent surveys. As you can see, these are similar to the other CORD projects, but once again, we see a diverse low income population with a majority of families participating in Medicaid or Texas Health Steps. Weight da status data definitely show a need for the program, with obesity rates of 19% for children aged 3 to 5, 28.3% for grade 2 children, and 35.2% for grade 5. Note that the rates of obesity in the preschool children is more than twice the nat national average, and the rates of obesity in the fifth grade children is approaching twice the national average. More data describing the baseline families can be seen in our publication in Childhood Obesity. And now I'd like to review the role of the Evaluation Center at the University of Houston in the CORD project. Again, I'd like to acknowledge the different investigators with the Evaluation Center, including investigators from the University of Houston, Arizona State University, the University of Maryland, Baylor College of Medicine, and California State University Fullerton. The CORD Evaluation Center is coordinated through the University of Houston and the overall objective of the comprehensive evaluation is to develop evidence-based recommendations for replicating and disseminating community-wide integrated public health and primary care programs based on the CORD model. The Evaluation Center is charged with using the pooled CORD data across all of the sites to provide proof of concept for the obesity chronic care model 
which is the model and framework that underlies all of the core projects. Several challenges exist regarding the anal analysis of the pool data, including a quasi-experimental or non-randomized study designs in two of the three projects, and wide heterogeneity of populations, communities, and interventions across the projects, as you've just seen. This heterogeneity may result in bias and confounding without careful attention to the structure of the projects and data. The evaluation contains many levels too. It includes not only impact evaluation, but a robust process evaluation, an evaluation of the sustainability of program components, and then a cost analysis. The Evaluation Center strategy involves the use of data harmonization and pooled data analysis techniques. Data harmonization includes the, connection, the collection of common measures across the multiple settings and levels of the CORD project. These measures were identified with the whole consortium using a consensus process. A second key element is the coding of the intervention using a standard taxonomy to describe the intervention's components, which allows for comparing apples to apples despite having disparate intervention activities. Lastly, the planned analytic models include techniques such as meta-regression, multi-level modeling, and other recent advances in pooled data analysis techniques. More details on the evaluation plan and methods, as well as the overall logic model for the evaluation and the measures used can be found in the Childhood Obesity article by Dr. O'Connor. This slide illustrates a timeline of the CORD Evaluation Center. So in year one, the evaluation process started with development of the common measures, our harmonization, and development of the data forms and the taxonomy. The data warehousing, which is aggregating and matching data, is an ongoing process throughout the project, not just at the end. The final data delivery from all projects across all settings from all levels begins began in September 2014 and is continuing through June or July of this year. Analyses and reporting on the full data cannot begin until data collection and delivery are complete. So we're really going to have a busy end of the year in 2015 and early 2016. And I'd like to turn the webinar back to Captain Blank. Thanks, Deanna. Um, as I've listened and, and saw the baseline data here, I know many of you that are on the phone are really excited to hear results uh, from the projects. But um, you know, we're just in the middle of year four, um, and so this is really a, an early peek into these projects. And we're we're very excited to uh, have future webinars where we're able to um, provide more of our findings. Um, but along with peer-reviewed manuscripts and webinars, we are also conducting with the evaluation um, center a congressional report. Um, among the evaluation aspects, as we've talked about, include outcome evaluation, process, sustainability. Uh, we're also looking at cost inputs related to the best practices, uh, as well as capturing uh, more story or qualitative information for success stories. Next slide. So as you've heard, there are um, many components to the CORD projects, and that's what's really made this an exciting project for us at CDC. We really were able to take the social ecological model, um, the many IOM reports, other guidelines that have come from the Division of School Health, uh, the work we see in the National Standards for Child Care, and really bring these together in these three communities to help children um, really um, succeed uh, and really not be left behind. So as we look at the lessons that are being learned in CORD, we're looking at the supports for community success in both prevention and management of childhood obesity. And this is where the chronic care model is so important because if we have about 16, 20, 30 percent of children who are already struggling with obesity, um, we know from the data that that does usually track into youth and tracks into adulthood, putting them at risk for some of the leading causes of death. We're also learning much from implementation of policy and environmental changes in places like child care schools in the community, and also seeing how we can link our messages and communication across 
to help support parents. Information systems is really an area where we've seen growth, whether that's electronic medical records or other health information technologies. Uh, again, how to best provide decision makers with information, triangulating data sources, as well as really uh, helping healthcare providers have uh, timely information when they're meeting with those parents and children. Another really important part of CORD has been the linkages with state and local government departments, departments of ed, departments of health, and also um, much of what is discussed in some of the manuscripts really is looking at the advisory input, so community coalitions, organization change, and meeting organizations where they're at. Next slide. So as we look toward the model of CORD, um, we're very hopeful that we will see in the future uh, beneficial changes in behavior, hopefully beneficial changes in weight. Um, and if we are able to show this proof of concept, uh, there are ways to look at CORD uh, as we move forward as a nation. One is that the Child Health Insurance Program will undergo reauthorization. Um, so we're interested to see again how this area for childhood obesity may fit within that program. Uh, we're also uh, working with healthcare providers and others to think about how uh, Medicaid and other groups are considering young children with obesity, and that may be an example of state waiver options. As we move through ACA, we're looking at, uh, looking at alternative payment models to support family child pediatric weight management, and that is definitely an, uh, an area <clears throat> of growth. Uh, we also have the novel aspect of CORD about the role of community health workers in obesity and especially childhood obesity. Uh, the literature is, is very um, complete as it, when it looks at uh, adult self-management, whether that's diabetes or heart disease, um, but it's fairly new to be looking at community health workers either as a bridge to parents or as part of a patient navigation system. As I've mentioned, again, the role of health IT in the digital age, uh, we're seeing how we can benefit uh, from these types of systems. When we think about school wellness, many of us think about a school wellness coordinator, um, and the CORD project has brought to light the need for someone who plays the role of a community integrator, someone who's, whose main job is to make the connections between groups who are interested in making changes related to health. So again, across the multiple settings of, of a community model. And in addition to this grant, which has just been four years here with these communities, looking at ways to sustain change. So once the, grant, once the grant is gone, how are there ways that communities can uh, really maintain and sustain the changes they've made? So some examples uh, from us here related to SNAP education, which is now allowed to use policy system environment in addition to its education approaches or public-private partnerships. So we put these two slides just together to, to get folks thinking uh, about the areas of need uh, and we're happy to entertain questions related to this. Next slide. So again, thank you for participating, and I'll turn it over to Brooks and Deanna. Thank you. Um, as it says here, the archive recording of this web uh, webinar and a PDF of the presentation slides will be available later this week. Uh, but we do have a few questions now. And please, if you have a question, feel free to submit it, and we'll try and answer as many of those as we can. So uh, the first question, and uh, Dr. Blank, I'll refer to, to you for this one, is it says, looked like you used the chronic care model, Wagner. Did you want to maybe talk about that across the projects? Sure, and folks from, the, from Suchi and Deanna can jump in as well. Um, with the Massachusetts example, Elsie uh, Tavares has been a real lead for us in this area as well as we think about um, self-management as part of an important uh, part of this. So as we look at the kind of tenets of how we have community support, we have the healthcare system, and also the individual or the family, um, the obesity chronic care model was one that really, um, really fit this area um, of the CORD model. Um, I don't know if Nancy Butte is on, but, but others who, who've really seen this at, at work uh, might want to talk about how, how we've really implemented it um, from the framework that it's provided. Sure. I'm happy to contribute to that question. Um, definitely, the, the obesity care model, informed in part by Wagner and others, was really instrumental in our ability to think about what needed to change in the healthcare system. So we worked with a federally qualified health center 
um, specifically three of their clinic sites. They have 11 that span Imperial County and South Riverside County. And it really helped us to identify what we needed to change to create system level changes. So, um, you know, training the providers on motivational interviewing, um, the practice changes, uh, well, really starting with policy changes and saying this is sort of what needed to happen from a policy perspective at the organizational level, and then what sort of flowed from that. Um, and so really creating a system of change whereby anybody who had contact with children um, that were there to, for whatever visit would, um, you know, get very specific um, health care from assessment all the way to treatment and referral. Um, and it really helped to be able to make changes in the electronic health records to alert the providers on, on some of the things that they needed to be doing as part of the new practice changes. Um, not, not to say that everything has gone smoothly. I think we have a lot of lessons learned from that. Uh, for example, our system was next gen and we were trying to make the system changes locally. And then when uh, NextGen provided an update to their system, we lost a lot of those local changes that we had made within uh, clinicas themselves. So really thinking in terms of sustainable changes, what is it that NextGen could integrate as part of their um, normal sort of updates and how can we use features within NextGen that may already be there to supplement the types of activities we're doing. Those are just some examples of what we did as part of the um, Our Choice study in Imperial County. Yes, in Texas, I know that uh, Dr. Sarah Barlow was very instrumental in engaging in that link between primary care and public health, uh, similar to how it was done in California. And Dr. Elsie Tavares also did a nice job of linking that in, in Massachusetts. So I think we have a lot of different examples uh, throughout the, the sites. So the second question is in Texas Cord, who pays for the kids to go to the YMCA? Do families pay to enroll? Uh, for the Cord pro uh, project, the we paid for the YMCA space. And then for the sports teams, we also paid uh, for vouchers for the children and families to go to participate in the sports teams. Uh, the families did not get a membership to the YMCA. We did do some uh, pilot work prior to this in which we gave out memberships, but it wasn't feasible um, in this part of the project. Okay, uh, the next project, uh, Dr. Ayala, if you could answer, uh, what is the edu education or background of the community health workers? Oh, that's a great question, and it probably varies by site. Um, I don't have the specific uh, data in front of me for the community health workers that are part of Clinicas. So they hired um, six to eight, over the course of the project, they've hired six to eight community health workers. Um, most of them are bilingual, bicultural, or Spanish language dominant. Um, all of them are from the community themselves. Their educational levels range from having completed high school to having some uh, higher education, although not necessarily a degree. I hope I got that right, um, or a higher degree, such as a college education. Um, so it really varies, and what we tried to do um, in previous studies, we had mostly Spanish language dominant, but we really wanted to try and reach as many people as possible. So it was important to us at least to have a few that were, um, that had some facility with the English language. Um, they really represent the communities they're working with. And so I think that, that was important for our, our site because we found that to be, for us at least, the most effective model. Thank you. Uh, another question that maybe uh, either Dr. Blank or uh, Dr. Ayala and I can contribute to as well is um, what approaches have been most effective in getting parents on board? Well, I'll start. 
Do that is the, that's the million dollar question from my perspective and I'm really glad someone asked it. Um, we have a, do as a side note, we have a doctoral student, um, Emily Schmid, who's actually working on a parent engagement study. Um, I would say among all the interventions we've done, engaging families around childhood obesity is the most challenging. At least it's been the most challenging for us. Um, we tried to uh, initially frame the intervention as about healthy lifestyles because that is ultimately what we were trying to promote. Um, but because there was so much focus around childhood obesity and the media coverage associated with it, focusing on childhood obesity, it was hard to sort of get away from the fact that ultimately what we were trying to reduce was excess weight gain and get kids at a healthy weight. Um, as a result of that, you know, I actually don't necessarily have a specific evidence-based answer for you. Um, part of uh, Ms. Schmid's research is going to help us understand that. Um, but what we know works so far is really making it as easy as possible for them to participate. So trying to have, um, although maybe the evidence might suggest an intervention that's over a longer period of time, we try to make the intervention as accessible as possible, and I'm specifically referring to the family wellness um, program. Uh, we know that messages around uh, risk for future health issues are moderately effective, at least with the Latino community, um, and specifically for some families, uh, but also focusing more specifically on the overall implications of the children's lives a quality of life long term, their ability to be productive um, and happy adults, I think is probably the message that might resonate more so than say a risk message. But really stay tuned for some of the evidence that we'll be able to generate about how to um, engage parents more effectively. I totally agree with uh, Dr. Ayala. Um, as to the messaging of this program. Um, one thing I would like to add is by stratifying by age group, we found that it was much more difficult to recruit families with children who were two to five years of age than for the older kids, the six to 12 year olds. It seems like at that age, the child is willing to go along with it. Uh, and it seems like more of an issue with the families. So they're more inclined to uh, seek additional help with that. So that's something that we're finding. Again, we're looking at the data, so hopefully we'll have more to come. Stay tuned. So, Dr. Blank, I've got a question Can for you. you. Oh. Uh, well, I, the only thing I was going to add, is I know that the Institute of Medicine related to the, the early care and education area is very interested in the question on parent engagement. Um, and they, they've been working across different groups, including United Way, um, Sesame Street, Head Start, and others to, to pull together experts who, who've um, hopefully been successful in parent engagement. So I also just wanted to say at a national level, there are groups that are starting to really uh, tease that apart as well. Great. So Dr. Blank, one question for you. What are your thoughts on extending this program to teenagers? I would probably go back to, to the sites, sites on that based on some of the things Deanna was just saying um, about the inclination of the children themselves to be part of a program. Um, I, I think, you know, as we travel around the nation and talk to families who are struggling with weight, um, once a child has started to feel stigma, bullying, or any discrimination related to, to their weight, um, you know, we really want to, we really want to help the self-esteem of that child and their family. Um, so I, I, I do think that the teenage years are really important uh, years where, where um, children themselves are empowered for change. Um, but, but Deanna or, or Suchi? Well, one thing I can say about with uh, teenage programs is a lot of what we focused on on this, on uh, CORD were parenting messages. Um, in with teenagers, they are becoming much more self-sufficient. So we would need to kind of rethink um, how we addressed it. So some of the strategies that we used. So Suchi, you want to? Yeah, no, I would just add that I would say that the whole community approach is very relevant for teens. I think it would be also very relevant for um, adults and even older adults. 
Um, I think, though, consistent with what Dr. Holscher is saying and, and what um, Dr. Blanc said, is that really what sectors and settings might you be working with? So it's really trying to determine where are teens li living their lives and what sectors and settings do we need to intervene on? And then potentially, and I know there's uh, less evidence for this, and, and hopefully um, researchers will, will find out more about this, is just the influence of peers and how we might be able to capitalize on unhealthy peer influences and, and sort of address the issue of the unhealthy um, peer influences. But really, I think bottom line, the whole community approach is good for everyone. So, Dr. Ayala, another question for you. In one of the core demonstration sites, there is a low participant level of fathers. Did you try any methods to engage more fathers? That's a great question. So, in our um, the family-based intervention that's being delivered out of Glinicas, which is part of the self-management support component of the obesity care model is based on an evidence-based intervention in which we tried to uh, involve fathers. Um, this was, uh, it's called Entre Familia, and um, I'm happy to share information about that intervention. Um, we set a very uh, small goal of trying to uh, involve the father and then evaluate uh, in the intervention and then evaluate um, his involvement and the extent to which it changed, um, the latter being just 25% of the, of the sample. Um, and we did everything possible to minimize the barriers, so trying to schedule uh, the home visits when the father wasn't working and whatnot. What we found from that study is that direct involvement of the fathers was challenging um, because they, and this may be Latino fathers, and I'm being very general, um, this is not um, specific to every single family, but in general, at least in the Latino culture, sort of the, the role of the mother being more important in terms of, um, you know, food preparation, activities that are happening in the home and whatnot. But the, the sources of indirect influence and support we identify as being super critical and in including the father's uh, parenting styles themselves. Um, so what we tried to do with the family wellness program, and that's really the piece where we're engaging the families the most, is that we invite all family members, and this is not limited to just the dads, but also uh, grandmothers and aunts and uncles, anybody that's really involved in the child's life, um, and, and see if, if we could get them involved. We don't have that process evaluation data um, yet, so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to um, inform the community about the extent to which fathers are involved, but it's really taking more of an indirect approach to their involvement. So if it's not culturally appropriate for us to say, you know, you're, you're involved in these activities, which we know they are, we know they influence what's purchased in grocery stores, we know what it, that they influence the types of leisure time activities that the family's engaged in, but they don't necessarily want to be the person that is um, identified as, as sort of caretaking for the children. That is definitely, from a cultural perspective, the mom's role. So it's sort of that fine line of getting their direct, indirect involvement, but directly influencing how they uh, parent their children. I hope that wasn't too convoluted, but I'm happy to share more information about that from other work we're doing. Thank you, Suchi. Uh, one last question, because we're getting tight on time. Um, how did you all address the issue of transportation? I can say that in the Texas site, uh, in Houston and in Austin, for the most part, we tried to make sure that uh, participating families did have access to transportation to get to the program. I know in some instances the city infrastructure was not a very um, conducive for that, and in at least one instance I know that a parent ended up uh, using cabs to come to some of the sessions. So that really was one of our biggest barriers in terms of attendance at the sessions. Um, Suchi, I don't know if you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, so the, the, uh, our Troy study was in a rural community, and in general, rural communities don't necessarily have the best sources of public transportation. Um, so we tried to reduce the, the barrier of transportation by, for example, um, 
you know, offering the family wellness programs, uh, you know, once two sessions back to back, um, you know, although we know from evidence that it may be better to just to deliver an intervention over a longer period of time, we, we felt it was more important that they get the skill to development, that they get the information, that they get the social support, and whether it was implemented in the most um, effective manner was less important than making sure that they at least got that um, skill development and support and knowledge. Uh, we did not pay for transportation. That was against what we wanted to do. We didn't pay for any sort of intervention involvement because we were really trying to see if we could sustain this without a significant in, uh, investment of research dollars into the intervention, except to obviously make the system policy and environment changes in the various sectors. Well, I hate to cut this great conversation short, but it looks like we've hit one o'clock, and so that means it's time for us to end. But I do want to remind everyone that the archive of this webinar is going to be available later this week um, on the msdcenter.org website. Uh, everyone will also get an email, all the registrants and attendees, a uh, follow-up email tomorrow with a direct link to our webinar archive section of the website, and we will shoot a link to the child obesity um, journal article, which is open access, I believe, for the rest of the month, so you can go and just grab all of those articles right now, um, and so you can take a, a deeper look at um, all the things that we went into today. But uh, with that, I would like to thank all of our uh, fabulous um, speakers and call your attention obviously here too to the contact information for the different cord sites if you'd like to reach out and either maybe get some of the materials they've used or ask some more follow-up questions we've provided that contact info for you as well there so uh, thank you all again and thank you for attending and uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar bye-bye